Last week we looked at Acts chapter 25, and as we did so, we were reminded of how we've come before earthly rulers. And as we come before earthly rulers, we stand as born again believers and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we follow that on this morning with another fairly likely passage to consider in Acts chapter 26. And we'll look at the theme, born again defense. And perhaps using the, the old language of Zion just reminds us afresh as to how alienated our world is to the reality of the things of Christ. I was hearing yesterday morning that so many folks have no idea of the language that's used by church nowadays. They have no understanding, and when they come into church, they find it so uncomfortable, and it's as though you or I were going into the sleaziest back road pub in this area. And you can imagine how uncomfortable many would we feel about doing so. Or maybe not, as the case may be. But the reality is, many folks find the things of Christ very uncomfortable. But should that prevent us from standing for Jesus? It should never prevent us from standing for Jesus. Because we're called to go into all the world and to proclaim good news. So let's see what Paul's example is for us this morning. <coughs> then Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defence. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defence against all the accusations of the Jews. And especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore I beg you to listen to me patiently. The Jewish people all know the way I've lived ever since I was a child. From, my, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. <coughs> they have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that I conform to the strictest sect of a religion, living as a Pharisee. And now it is because of my hope and what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. This is the promise our twelve tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. King Agrippa, it is because of this hope that these Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it credible, incredible that God raises the dead? I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem, on the authority of the chief priests. I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and the commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It's hard for you to kick against the goals. And then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, then to the Gentiles. 
I preach that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to do this to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I'm saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer, and as the first to the rise from the dead, would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You're out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I'm convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long. I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. King Rose and with him the governor and Bernice and those sitting with them. And after they left the room, they began saying to one another, this man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Amen and praise God for a fairly lengthy passage of Scripture. And it's good for us to actually read Scripture in a prolonged manner. Because it reminds us that God's word is a lamp to our feet. And he leads us forward. Much has been made of the death of Billy Graham and his witness and his testimony to millions and millions of people around the world. In the 1950s in our country, Billy Graham challenged the church in Britain like no one else had done before. At the Harringay Arena on March the 1st to May the 29th, he held campaigns each night and literally thousands and thousands of people were saved. The following year, from March to April, he ministered in Glasgow's Kelvin Hall to packed audiences. And then after that, he ministered in other various cities throughout Scotland. What happened then? Hundreds and hundreds of people went forward each night to find true faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And from that moment in time in Scotland, suddenly there was the reality of God preparing the next generations of church leaders. Many of my colleagues in ministry, who are a bit older than me, they came to faith through the Billy Graham campaigns. Around that time, they heard the call of God upon their life. God called them according to his purpose. They went on to do their training and various other things and then went on to serve as church leaders. During that generation of the 60s and 70s, many of the church leaders in our churches, Baptist churches and evangelical churches throughout Scotland, many gave thanks to God for the ministry of Billy Graham because they had for the first time heard the gospel, received Christ as Lord and Saviour, and went on to serve him, and as they served him, led others to Christ, and so the story goes on. Sometimes we forget history is important. And it's when we look back in history, we can learn some of the lessons of a born-again defence. Many folks went along to these rallies, and as they did so, went along as skeptics. Some went along to be entertained out of curiosity. 
to see what was all this hype was about. And as they went along, suddenly their eyes were opened in a move of God's Spirit like Scotland had never seen before. Back in 1975, you know, I never really gave much thought up until that summertime what my church leaders and what my minister thought of the Bible. I never gave much thought as to what the church elders thought about the Bible and the things of Christ. But the moment I received Christ as Lord and Saviour, suddenly that became extraordinarily important to me. I wanted to have an assurance that those who were leading knew Christ as Saviour and Lord. And in a very clumsy kind of way, I stood in a lot of toes during those days, asking some very pointed questions about salvation, about what my church leaders and my minister actually believed about the gospel. I'm not going into too many details today. But suffice to say that on occasions, I was less than tactful. Or as some of you might say this morning, I'm still the same. But the reality was, I did know at that time, there were many of our church leaders who were not born again. And some were challenged by the questions that I asked. And it made them think again as to what about the things of Christ? What think ye of Christ? What think ye of Christ? And perhaps we need to ask that question this morning of ourselves. What think ye of Christ? You know, so many were not born again and had no intention of relating to this kind of extreme American gospel. Many church leaders in the 1950s actually campaigned not to allow their congregations or denominations to go to the Billy Graham rallies. This is extreme American gospel thinking. Don't go. This man will lead you astray. And yet, they went, they heard, and they received the gospel of Christ. And their lives were never the same again. You know, when I read John 3 and uh, the, the, the discourse with Jesus and Nicodemus, when you begin to read that discourse and you go back to it time and time and time and time again, the whole aspect of born-again theology is there weaved through the whole of the Gospel. And then when you come along to one, two, and three letters of John, those just open up the love of God. God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son so we could live through it. I remember reading John 3.16 and the letters of John for the first time shortly after coming to faith in Christ. And it's suddenly opening a door that I never thought possible. Suddenly there was a light. Suddenly there was an opening. Suddenly Christ was real. And for many folks in the 1950s, that would be the case. And Billy Graham preached as he'd never done before. And he preached that same old gospel message, the need to be born again, that we're going to escape the wrath of God at the end of time. It was clear, it was simple, some would say simplistic even. But the message, nobody could mistake. It was clear as a bell. Ringing the warning. 
And unless we were born again, we would go to a lost eternity. And of course, the reality of that was Billy Graham's famous words. And the famous words of being in the place of the Bible says. Because you see, that's what separated believer and non-believer. It separated the born-again church member from the non-born church again member. It separated the minister who actually believed the gospel and the minister that didn't believe the gospel. And likewise church leaders as well. What the Bible says made all the difference. The authority of God's word. And it's the same for today. It's a separating phrase in our generation of political correctness. What the Bible says goes first and foremost. Not what government and man says. The Bible says is true because it is God's inspired, breathed word. That's literally what God's word is described in scripture. It is like the breath of God coming from the mouth of God. God speaks forth. And people have to listen. And as the word goes forth, sharp and many two-edged sword, folks become born again. If they want to receive that word of God in all its truth and with all its promises. If they don't receive, the reality is there are consequences. And we need to be mindful of that this morning. And when Paul gives a born again defense, in the midst of rulers and authorities, he mentions the reality of wrath and judgment. And in our generation, wrath and judgment features very little on the radar of preaching because it makes people feel uncomfortable, it makes people feel unsafe. It takes away their security blanket. But the reality is, these are words that have to be said if folks are going to be born again. You see, for many folks, being born again doesn't even ping on the radar of their lives. Until for some, like Nicodemus, the scales fall from their eyes. Because someone has had the courage to speak the words of gospel truth. And when they speak the words of gospel truth, suddenly the light comes on. Bing! It's there. <coughs> and folks then want to know more. And I wonder if our relationship with Jesus is in the born again category this morning? Or have we become so comfortable in our Christianity that we will not rock the boat or upset anybody again? We'll just amble along as we do week by week by week. And then one day God will call us home, or he'll come again, and we will enter into heaven. But how many family and friends, neighbours and work colleagues, those whom we socialise with, how many of them are going to be strewn in our wake, going in the opposite direction? For lost eternity. You know, this week's been quite a roller coaster week for me. Yeah. Yeah. Because I've realised again afresh of the urgency of the gospel. And that was before I went to the meeting yesterday, which was quite intense. And I think intentionally so. Because I think a lot of church leaders yesterday realised afresh how comfortable they had become. Good born again guys. Great preachers. 
doing great work for the gospel, but had become so comfortable that the urgency of the gospel was void. The gas was at a low peak, to use an old-fashioned phrase. Perhaps they knew that the valve just to be turned up a bit so that it burned fresh again. And you know when we read that passage of scripture at the beginning, it's just as though Paul has the valve turned up and suddenly he becomes so animated and he just burns with the gospel and he just is in full flight. And that's what our nation needs again. You know, when you look back in history, and history is important, as I've said already, you look back at the great preachers that we had in our nation, down through the centuries, phenomenal preachers of the gospel, men and women of me, eh? phenomenal preachers of the gospel. Where are our great preachers now? Where are the household names? The gas is at a low peep in Scotland. And it needs to be turned up again. And it's only as God's people rise as one that suddenly the direction of the church and the work of the gospel changes in our nation. And that's what being born again is all about. Loving and serving the one who saved us. Telling other hungry people where to find true spiritual food. And not the life destroying snacks that are often given and sent out as pure truth. When Dr. Graham Scroggie preached on this passage in Charlotte Chapel in the 1930s, he titled his sermon, The Invincibility of the Christian Certitude. Well, when I read that verse, I thought, what's he talking about? And then I had to go and look up my dictionary and find out. That's how you learn. The invincibility of Christian servitude. Well, being a simple guy, the title of my sermon this morning is Born Again Defense. It says the same thing. Paul was certain of whom he belonged to. Paul was 100% for Christ. Born again defense. He knew that the protection of Christ was there with him. And he could speak with boldness. You know, Scroggie was nine, one of nine children born to Scottish parents in Alfred down in England. And such as was the family's finances, he had to go out and work and he had to study in the evenings Probably harder than most in order to gain a place at Spurgeon's College in London. He studied for his calling as a born again believer in Christ. He was sharp in mind. He was kind in delivery. He was straight down the line biblically. And you know, when he was called to his first two churches, he was fired. In other words, he was thrown out in his ear. Why? Because of his biblical preaching, which offended folks. And it flew in the face of the modernism and the worldliness of his generation. Sounds familiar, does it? You see, so many ministers nowadays are in the same boat, except they capitulate and they lie down. And they just conform to the congregation they minister to. And they don't fly in the face of the reality of this generation. They don't give a born again defense any longer. They give snack messages that don't bear fruit. And is it surprising that it doesn't bear fruit? Well, after those two first ministries of Scroggie, his later ministries were something else to behold. But he left healthy churches, 
full of born-again believers, giving the next pastor who came along and church leader a good foundation on which to build. Biblical truth proclaimed. Biblical truth actually coming forth. And as it forth, as it went forth, it bore fruit time and time and time again. You know, a born again congregation is a good foundation to minister from. A non born again congregation is like sandy foundation, you know, like the house that Jesus talked about in his parable about the, 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 the house that's built on sand, the house that's built on rock. If there's no born again foundation, it just goes boom, down, nothing left. If there's a good foundation there, a foundation of the gospel, then there is a foundation worth building on. Because it will always remain stable, truthful, and loving. And Paul in our passage leaves the leaders and dignitaries, the kings and the rulers, he leaves them in no doubt as to what they need to do. They need to be born again. He was certain of the message he was proclaiming. He was born again and he needed others to be born again as well because he knew the wrath of God was coming. And when Paul was given the green light to speak out in his own defense by Agrippa, Paul was totally fired up to speak the truth. Totally fired up to speak the truth. You are permitted to speak for yourself, Agrippa says in verse 1. And maybe Paul thought to himself the sentiments of my old secondary school grace that we used to have to say every lunchtime. We'll change days now. Remember the grace we said? For what we're about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thankful. It was a bit misnomer to the kind of food that we got dished up from central kitchens and vine. But the reality is, Paul knew what his <coughs> listeners needed to hear. And for what they were about to receive, may the Lord make them truly thankful. Hard message, difficult message, challenging message, but they needed to hear it. And if they didn't hear it, they were going to hell. That's not popular, is it? Many of us this morning feel a bit uncomfortable. The reality is that's what's happening. We've watered down the gospel so much in our generation that we have failed to recognise the consequences of saying to God and to His Son Jesus Christ, I don't want anything to do with it. How many graves, open graves, has there been the proclamation of salvation over someone who has been far away from Christ? We are not allowed to judge. Never will we judge. But the reality is, we're either born again or we're not born again. If we're born again, we go to glory. If we don't, we go to hell. We need to hear that in this generation. We need to hear that. To remind ourselves of the urgency of the gospel. And as Paul takes the floor in verse 2, with a hand outstretched, he speaks forth with a boldness and with a confidence. Nothing is going to hold him back. And why should it hold us back if we are truly born again? Because we speak from a foundation of confidence and a foundation that is stable, the Lord Jesus Christ. The rock upon whom we will build. You know, the dignitaries, as one writer describes, receive a calm and dignified message. Even though Festus is so contemptuous, Agrippa is challenged and stricken in conscience, and Ber Bernice is no doubt obdurate. In other words, each one had their own feelings and their own thoughts, and perhaps we do this morning ourselves. But I believe what I'm sharing this morning is what God wants me to share to stir us up afresh. To realize where we're at. Individually and also as a congregation. 
you know, the writer paints a gloomy picture of these folks. But is it really a gloomy picture? Because when folks are challenged, it makes them think. When they think, they begin to consider the reality of their own condition. It was a very tense place to be in the midst of all these rulers and the authorities. It was a very tense place for Paul to be in the wheeling and dealing of politics, the religious and the secular politics, I may add. They're very evident in this particular picture of this chapter and last chapter. And this is Paul's eighth speech and third account of his testimony to the officers of the guard and the soldiers who were hearing his testimony over and over and over again. And you know, I've considered the reality of what that must have been like. You know, you're standing as a guard to attention. You're hearing testimony over and over and over again. It's making you think. How many of these guards became born-again believers? We don't know. How many of the dignitaries became born-again believers? We don't know. But the reality is, God's Word says that His Word will not return null or void, but return pressed down, shaken together and flowing over. Do you have to believe that we'll be the harvest? And certainly as the, the years went by, many, many Roman soldiers were born again. Many in the authority, the higher echelons of authority, were born again. We know from scripture there were many religious leaders born again, Nicodemus included. And so it goes on. The born again defense makes all the difference. It changes folks. And as it's changed, suddenly they have a hope that's sure, steadfast, and certain. And in verses 2 to 23 and 25 to 27 and 29, you find Paul's defense. That's his defense strategy. In verses 24 and 28 to 30 to 32, the effect on the listeners is there, including Festus and Agrippa. And it's because of Paul's willingness and humbleness that he's prepared to speak the truth in love, even if it's difficult to do. It would have been very easy for Paul, very easy for Paul to play the political game. He was well versed now, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He could easily have played the religious politic card. He could easily have played the, poli the political card of being a Roman citizen. He could have walked away, no problem at all. We see that in the last verse. If he hadn't appealed to Caesar, then he could have walked away. He could also have rescinded that appeal and walked away. But he didn't. He didn't. And why didn't he? Because of the urgency of the gospel message. The urgency of the born again defense so that others would hear the message of truth and be saved. And you know, we live in a generation of sound bites, information bites, texts, tweets, Facebook, etc. And we all have our abbreviations, we all have our shorthand language. I mean, can you imagine a university lecturer or a teacher giving a two minute sound bite to convey all the information? required for the most important exam in learning on a particular course. You can't imagine that, can you? For some folks there, it's a whole year of learning, a whole year of lectures, a whole year of research and so on to be prepared. Sometimes we treat God's work just like the sound by culture that seems to be expected of us. We need to spend time in God's work. We need to savor God's work. We need to unpack God's work. We need to absorb God's work. And it's only as we do so 
we can then convey God's word to a lost generation. You know, Paul could have come forth with the privilege card. I'm a Roman citizen. I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I've got privilege. I've got status. I've got symbol. I'm here. He could have played that card. I know my rights approach. He could have played that card over and over again. But what does he do? He comes with humble thanksgiving in his heart for the opportunity to speak to these folks in authority. And it's amazing the technique that Paul has here. He comes with the peace of Christ. And the peace of Christ paves the way. And folks courteously listen to him. And that is absolutely awesome when you consider the reality of the circumstances surrounding Paul's defense. And Zechariah declares in Zechariah 4 and 10, Who dares despise the day of small things? Well, Paul didn't despise the folks who were there. He loved them so much to share good news. And he finds himself talking appropriately with wisdom and tact. And you know, in a generation where sharing our faith with a colleague can in some circumstances lead to internal workplace discipline situation. We need to learn how to assess our circumstances and pray before the Lord to learn how best to live and share the gospel in a humble manner. Their eternal life, the eternal life of our colleagues depend on it. They'll go to a lost eternity lest we kindly get alongside them and share good news. Jesus says, be Humble, be humble, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. I'm sending you out amongst wolves. Be humble. And in the light of this, we need to be aware of the customs and the controversies of our generation that can easily finish us at the first post. I wonder what you would do this morning if you go into nursery. To share good news with the children. With God, but the of course. And you're talking about creation. God made all things. Very simple. And a three year old sits bolt upright in his wee chair. And as he sits up, Mr. Brown, I believe in the Big Bang Theory. How do you react to that? How do you react to that when a three-year-old child has been indoctrinated at home with things that are clashing with some of the truths of Scripture? Why is this serpent harmless as dog? Right, kids, close your eyes. Keep them tight shut. And they have lights like we've got here. Let's count to ten. Keep them shut now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Open your eyes. Oh, 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 simply set the lights all on him and, and they're rubbing their eyes. I said, when God said, let there be light, there was light and it was good. And the same little boy said, wow, that's just like a big bang. Well, God created. I'm going home and tell my mum and dad. I don't know sure exactly what conversation took place. Why is a serpent harmless as that? We need to learn afresh how to share God's good news. What do you do in the born again defense of our generation? <coughs> you know, it's more important to share good news with folks than anything else in this generation. And you know, we do live in the soundbite era where folks want to share everything of their life, including what they had for breakfast. Hence why we put the picture on the screen. Two slices of toast and two eggs. That was one of the posts on a friend's Facebook page. And they post what they have for breakfast every morning on the phone. It, it's, 
it takes belief up to say, maybe it's just I'm getting old, I don't understand why you really want to do that, but some folks do. And they get so enthusiastic and excited about it. And the pals get excited about it. Well, can you imagine posting something of Christ on your social media page? Along with a nice picture as well. Why is the serpent harmless as done? The folks get excited about having two eggs, a picture of two eggs and two slices of toast in the Facebook. Think what the things of the kingdom would do for their life. On again. Excitement because they've seen the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul declares his pedigree as a Jew and a Pharisee, zealous persecutor, hounder of the Christians in verses 3 to 11. 12 to 18, Paul's conversion, and out of his love for Jesus, he's willing to declare and serve a new master. You know, when salvation visits our life, we are serving a new master. We leave the masters of this world behind, and we serve the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is seated at the right hand of the Father, even now interceding for us. And our testimony changes. Our life story changes. We are no longer in this world as non-believer. We are in this world as born-again believer. And as born-again believer, we are transformed and changed. And therefore, our whole outlook and approach to life is changed. Or should be changed. The Holy Spirit at work within us. And as his Holy Spirit is at work within us, suddenly a holy boldness and a new courage comes to us. And Festus does what many folks do today, they challenge the realities of what we believe. And perhaps more and more than ever nowadays in 2018, what we believe is challenged by many other folks. But you know, over the last 42 years, I've been a believer. I've never failed to be amazed at the techniques that the devil will stoop to. <coughs> you know, I'll never attain the intellectual level of Paul, never in a million years. Yet the highly learned or not learned, the technique of Satan's way of trying to put down the believer is ever there. And that's what happened with Paul. And if it happens with the likes of Paul, the rest of us mere mortals, the same thing will happen. You're stupid. How dare you think that? How can you possibly think that? Basically, that's what's happening here. See things using the your stupid car. And it's a stab to the heart and to the mind. I had a maternal grandmother who was a character. A shop steward in the dockyard during the war who fought for the extra bonuses for all our colleagues, and you never, never, ever crossed my grandmother. <laughs> she was the ultimate fife matriarch. But she also had an acid tongue, and would regularly use the your stupid car to put you down. And my mother knew that. She'd been through it. So when Grand did the your stupid car, Mum came along and said, you know, you can do it. You can manage it. You're blessed. We love you. Go for it. And the good overcame the bad. And the reality is, we need to remind ourselves of that card of Satan. And stop bowing down to his ways and start building each other up in our most holy faith mm -hmm. so that we can go forth for the kingdom's sake. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18 reminds us for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved it is the power of God. The power of God's word and the power of the Holy Spirit. And perhaps we need to remind ourselves of that this morning as well. 
and realise that, as in everything, we need to go with God's flow and not the flow of this world. Paul came before all those in authority and he didn't hold back. And neither must we if we bear the name of Christ. Verse 14 reminds us that it's hard to kick against the goats. Now you may wonder, what on earth is that all about? Well, a goat was actually a spike that was put on the plowshare or the cart that was being drawn by oxen. And so you had a very mature ox who would be the lead oxen and normally it was coupled with a younger, a bit more feisty ox. And these more feisty oxes, well, sometimes they didn't like what they were doing. And they would kick against the plowshare or they would kick against the cart, sometimes irreparably damaging it. So the farmer or the, the person who owned the thing would actually then put these wooden spikes on them. So when the goat would actually kick, it would kick against the goats, then it would be, oh, I'm not going to do that again, that was sore. It was a matter of discipline. And the picture we've got here is that, you know, if we kick against the things of God, then we get hurt. And perhaps the reality is, in closing this morning, we need to realise that we need to stop kicking against the things of God. And receive the reality of God once more. And to hear his call afresh upon our life. Because if we don't, there is no future. In 1999, when Julian and I came here, we had about 100 people sitting in the congregation. And we've seen a number of folks move away from work and job and so on. A goodly number promoted to glory. And Julie and I were having a conversation at three o'clock this morning about whether that is a church. And last deacon's meeting we were talking about these things and saying, where do we go? We're at the, the tipping point of church where we can either tip down the way and just slip into glory and the church moves into decline. Or we can start on the upper road again. And seeing others find faith in Christ and going on and on and on with them. And this morning I want us to think about that. Where are we going in our faith? Where are we going in our walk with God? Where are we going as a church? What does God require of us? He requires that born again message to be proclaimed and to be defended and to be shared. And you know, as we do that, we'll see a lot of filled seats in this place in the days of my life. Food for thought this morning? Let's pray. Father God, in your mercy, we know that so often we have let you down. We have not done as you have required of us to do. We have thought more of ourselves than we have of those around us. This morning, Father, Continue to distill your word in our hearts so we might not sin against you. <coughs> Father, in your mercy, in your mercy we cry out to you. We say, help, Lord. We need your help. We're in need of heaven's help because we can't do it on our own. Father, individually and corporately speak into our lives. Speak into the lives of the leadership of this fellowship as well. 
grant that we would all see the vision of Christ come together and help us to run with that vision. <coughs> and Father, bring the lost and the lonely. Bring them to a place where they can find the true rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we no longer want to be a sinking ship or a ship sailing aimlessly across the ocean with no destination. <coughs> Father, give us a full purpose once more. Open our eyes, Lord. We want 